Romans chapter number 8. Um, my goal with me being not here next week is to get through this passage. And uh, I put in the overhead as a title, Are You Sure About All This? with the question. And the reason is, is because that's what's going to happen now, starting in verse 26, really down through the end of the chapter, is Paul is going to lay out now and say, see, you see who you are. You see Romans 6, your identity. You're dead from sin. You're alive in Christ because of who you are in Christ. Sin doesn't have dominion over you anymore. You see that? You got that? No, you're not. You understand that? Now, you see in chapter, so that's your position, Romans 6. Chapter 7, we're dead to the law. We're, we're going to operate under grace, and grace is going to be the, 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 the fundamental rules that we're going to play by. So we're going to be in the right position, playing by the right rules of the game. And then in chapter 8, we begin to see the issue here of the Spirit coming along and working with our spirit and that issue of, the, of sonship, that issue of we are adults in the family of God. When God looks at you and I today, he doesn't see children, he sees adults. When he looks at the Corinthians and, and, and you know, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians and Galatians, those books of reproof and correction are also really books of doctrine as well because every Every word and every verse means something to us at, at all times. But so what does he say about the Corinthians? You are carnal. You're babes. So even though the Corinthians are adults in the family, what are, how are they behaving? <laughs> like babies. They're carnal. They, there's some growing that has to be done. So adults grow, and we begin to look at that. And last week we, we started in verse 18, Romans 8:18. 8, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And we went out and we looked at that great payday uh, when we are uh, called home and our inheritance in the heavenly places and we're, we're, when, when the events that we call the rapture begin to happen and we're taken and we meet the Lord and we're presented to the Father and then we're placed off and we looked that last time all the way down through verse 25 there. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And there's that issue of a, a patient waiting for the hope, our hope. So in verse 26 now, you come to a verse, the first word is an interesting word, likewise. And like, likewise the Spirit. So just as we've seen the Spirit's activity all the way down through the, 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 the information, just as we've seen the, the Spirit working here, likewise, now we're going to add to this working in the walk of the Spirit. We're going to add to some things here. We're going to add to the previous set of information. The Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And, and I'll be honest with you, those two verses get abused. They get beat up. They get, they get twisted. And they'll say, you see when he says he's going to make intercession for you? You know, you pray because you don't know how you ought to be praying. So you send a, you send a shot of prayer up there to the, the Lord, and the Spirit takes it and says, really, Lord, this is what he really means. And, blah, 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 blah. and you know what? That's just a bunch of foolishness. It's religious hogwash. Okay? You don't know how to pray. There's a couple things that are going on in the text of why you don't know how to pray. We'll get to those in just a minute. But what I want you to see is verse 26 has a context. The context is going to go back up, really, to verse 18. What does verse 18 say? For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There's some, there's some things that are going to happen here where the Spirit is going to come in and work with us. If you look back up at verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So there's going to be some working of the Spirit here down in verse 26 now. Likewise. So we're going to add to the information we just came through. We're going to add to that, the Spirit. There, there's some things now the Spirit's going to come and work with you on. He's going to help our 
infirmities. Now, that, that word, that's an interesting word. There's several different kind of infirmities here. One is verse 18, the suffering of the present time. Does the Spirit come along and help you with that? Sure. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he's the, God of, he's the father of all comfort. He's the God of all comforts. The, the father, oh, butchered that, didn't I? 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. So the, the infirmities here can be several. One, they can be we don't know how to pray as we ought. That's an infirmity. That's a struggle for most, is knowing what to pray for and how to pray. But there's also the struggle in the suffering category back in verse 18. So how then do we work this out? How, how then do you look at this and say, okay, what's going on here? Because the question is, is are you sure about this? Well, the answer to that is yes, you should be, and, and the passage is going to teach us that. Come over with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There's some things that we understand as we've been coming through the, the process here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse 15. How do we deal with sufferings, with infirmities? If you want to say the infirmities of suffering, how do you deal with it? If you want to say it's about prayer, we'll talk about that here in just a second. But either category, what is the Spirit going to come and do? He's going to come and help you with it. Now, how does the Spirit help you? You see, that becomes the, really the question with everybody, is how then does the Spirit help me? Well, look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. How do you renew your inner man day by day? What does Romans 12, 1 and 2 tell us? We're transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? How do we renew our minds? Through the Word. How often? Day by day. Every day. That's why we do the reading programs of three chapters a day, read through the Old Testament, whatever you need. Why? So that you're constantly putting the Word of God in front of you. What does that renewed mind cause you to think? How does that renewed mind cause you to think? What does it cause you to think? Verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which are not seen are eternal. Now what verse 18 is telling you is we walk by faith. That's down there in chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. All of this is an operation of your faith. Faith in the word of God to you. How does the Spirit help us if, if our infirmities are suffering? Verse 17. He gives us a thinking process, does he not? How do we think about this? We think that the suffering of the present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory, but we're thinking that the light it's a light affliction. It's not a heavy thing. It's something easy. It's something no, no big deal. Now, you may say, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute, Rick. <laughs> Well, you and your experience in the moment, it's a heavy deal. The loss of a loved one, you know, it's just a heavy deal sometimes. For others, more. I can remember when, when Brian passed away, it, that was a heavy deal, you know, because of the relationship. For some, it was, oh, my goodness, but okay. But for family up close, it's heavy. The light affliction, it's but for how long? It's a moment compared to what? Eternity. See, this is a thinking process. This is a way of, of working through the situation, of working the problem, okay? You know, I was good in math until the alphabet got involved. And then once the alphabet got involved, forget about it. I never understood how a letter could equal a number, but it does, and that's okay. So, you know, what do you do? You work the problem. I worked problems and didn't show my work, and I got counted off because I didn't show my work. I'm like, but that's the right answer, right? The teacher's like, yeah. I said, so then what's the problem? She goes, you're supposed to show your work. I said, I, 
What, it's the right answer, though, right? You know? No, you, you work it through. You work down. The light affliction is which but for a moment worketh for us. There's a working going on here. There's an activity that's designed to produce something. What's it going to produce? A, an ex, a far more exceeding internal weight of glory. And there's that glory program again, the stuff we looked at last week, and that plan that the Father has called glory to exalt his son but if you look back up at verse 15 the end of that verse what does he say through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of god when you work through the situation when you're thinking about whatever's going on in front of you the problem the issue because this is an infirmity this is something we're suffering have you ever suffered for jesus and it'd be a good thing i have every <laughs> You know, you go to the ball game. I'm suffering for Jesus. Woohoo! <laughs> you know, we were talking earlier about NASCAR. Hey, I'm suffering for Jesus. I went to NASCAR. Hey, okay, it's so, it's everybody to his own, I guess. You, folks on the internet, there are people in the room, okay? <laughs> but see, the thing is, is what happens is, is when you're in the middle of that, how do you bring glory to God? By walking by faith. What does that word say? What's the word say? That infirmity is just for the moment. And when you walk through it properly, when you do verse 18, you're not looking at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Why? Because the things which aren't seen are eternal. When you're looking at the eternal issue, that doesn't mean that you don't cry and weep and, you know, break down. Okay, it doesn't mean you don't have any emotions or feelings. It's just you're working towards it. You don't let it defeat you. Now come back to Romans 8. You don't let it defeat you. If you let it defeat you, then no one's going to get the glory. But when you work through it, you go through however it is for you to go through it, and you come out on the other side and you say, you know what, he's the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort, and I'm going to get my comfort in who I am in Christ. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. He comes on, and, he, and He's going to help you. And how He helps you is through the Word of God working in you as you renew your mind. Romans 5, verse 1. We, we were in 6. Look back there at chapter 5, talking about infirmities. <clears throat> Romans 5 and verse number 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When the infirmity comes up, what do we know? It is not God getting even with us. Because what do I have with God? I have peace. 1 Corinthians 10, you just write the verse down, verse 13 says that when things come up against you, they are common to man. There's nothing special about you going on. God is not trying to use the circumstance, come back over to Romans 8, and teach you a lesson. Now, you can learn some things in the lesson that you sit there and go, hey, I can learn to apply some verses to it, but God didn't send it on you. It came on you because it's common to man. And our, in our infirmities we can then begin to think appropriately and accurately and look at the details and say, now let's, we, we, we win. We're winners. We have victory. We've ac ac accessed the victory program that we're a part of, and now we have victory. Now, Romans 8, 26. So if the infirmities is the suffering, verse 18, you've got a way to handle that. and The Spirit works with you through the Word. But if the infirmities is that we don't know how, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So if it's about not knowing what to pray for, that's okay too. Because you're in Romans 8. You're a babe in Christ. You're just learning. You're just growing. And guess, when you come to understand the issues of right division, you know what the first thing that leaves your Christian life is? Prayer. Because you've been praying like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You've been looking at it going, if I ask him, I'll get it. 
And if I dump enough faith quarters in the, his vending machine up there in the sky, he'll just deposit that thing right down there and it'll be good to go. But what does right division do? Comes along and says, no, you don't belong in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You need to come over here in Romans to Philemon. Now come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So when it comes to the issue of prayer, should you pray? Well, yeah. Paul tells you, pray without ceasing. Ever, have you ever tried that? That means you ought to think about what prayer is. If prayer is a posture or a position, hands in the air, face on the floor, in the closet, whatever it is, then you can't pray without ceasing if it's a posture. Because how do you pray in the closet if that's where you pray and go to work? It doesn't work. Okay? So if you're so prayer then isn't a posture. It isn't a position. It's a communicating and talking with the Father about the details of life and how to take his word and apply it to those details. Hey, stuff's going on. You know, hey, there we got trouble. How do I get through this? He says, well, i got a verse for you. Okay, great. Now we read the verse and boom. Man, you know, we're over here and it's good times and everything's going good. But man, it's just, wow, you know, okay, i got a verse. Rejoice evermore. <laughs> and again, I say rejoice. i got all this because you're constantly talking to the Father. That's what prayer is. Now look at 2 Corinthians 12. And verse, well, verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. So Paul's got a thorn in the flesh. Now he doesn't tell you what it is. It could be the people, it could be the infirmities, the health issues, it could be a number of things. But they, the design of the thorn in the flesh was to keep him humble. He has just received a bunch of information back up in verse 2, 3, and 4, and 5, and 6 there that he, it's not time to, to, to make known. You, man, when you get something new, don't you, you like to tell people, don't you? <laughs> you know, Paul was chomping at the bit to give that Ephesians doctrine out there. Just wasn't time yet. Relax. Back up. And he sent this thorn in the flesh to do what? To kind of keep him focused on that. How many times did Paul go to the Lord to ask him to take it away? Notice verse 8 very carefully. What did Paul ask the Lord to do? Make it go away. Make it depart from me. He was three times he asked the Lord to, Lord, that thorn in the flesh, take it away. So you know what that tells me? If my apostle can pray that way, Philippians 4 says I can pray that way too. Where I can bring everything to the Father's throne. I can talk to him, Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 over there. I, and look, look over there. Hold on to Corinthians. Philippians 4. You, folks, there is such a misnomer and misunderstanding about how prayer works in the age of grace that it's scary. Philippians 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So I can bring everything. I can bring a prayer, a generalized situation. I can bring supplications, a very specific item. But I'm to bring it with what? Thanksgiving. There's a, not a want, not a give me, give me, give me, give me. You know? You go into the toy store. I took, when the kids were little, we went in there and Ricky comes around. He's got a buy. I said, son, you don't need that. You know, we're not doing that. We're doing this. He goes, yeah, but daddy... I want it. I said, no, we're not doing that. He goes, yeah, but Daddy, I need it. See, you know, he learned quick. Shift that gear, you know. And so it's, it's not a, I need this now, Lord, you know. Hey, I need that. It's not that at all. It's a thing of thanksgiving. What are you thankful for? What did he do for you? Everything. <laughs> and then he says, verse 7, here's the answer. Make all your requests known. The answer is that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep, guard, protect, influence your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. I'll come back there to 2 Corinthians 12. Paul says, Lord, three times, take this bad boy away. Get it out of here. 
And you know what the Lord does to him, verse number 9? He gives you the answer to prayer in the age of grace. And he gives you the answer in the first five words of that verse. And he said unto me. Now what he said was, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. But what I want you to focus on is those first five words. And he said unto me. What is the word of God to Paul in that moment? Well, it was a verse. My grace was sufficient to thee. What is the word of God to you in the moment you're praying about and thinking about? It might not be my grace is sufficient. It may be you need to get a job, dude, and grow up and move on and get on with life. Uh Uh-oh. Sorry, Joel. Okay. It may be something else. But what is the answer to the prayer? And he said unto me. What does the word of God say? So when you come back to chapter 8 of Romans, and he says, hey, the spirit is going to work with you. He's going to come along and help you. The end of verse 27 there, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Where do you find the will of God? In the Word. He's going to help you. He's going to come in and work with you through the Word of God. And again, we understand that from our studies in 1 Corinthians 2. He's going to make known all those things, the deep things of God, and He reveals them to us by His Spirit through some words that the Spirit's going to use. It's going to work for you a far more an exceeding and a weight, eternal weight of glory. The promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So the question, are you sure about this? Well, yeah. Why? Because I've got the Holy Spirit working alongside of me, don't I? He's not working against me. He's working with me. He's coming along to to cause that word that I've been studying and putting into my inner man and renewing my mind with to come alive. He's energizing those verses. He's making them real. I don't know. (laughs) Try to think of different ways to make it real to you. That's what he's doing. Then he says, verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And oh man, now we got everybody going good, right? And again, this is another verse that gets taken to church every Sunday, but sometimes not accurately. Obviously, in verse 28, we're talking about saved people. So when you see this posted by the unsaved people, because they have access to the Word of God just as you do, you quickly just say, yeah, okay, (laughs) Why do bad things happen to good people, right? That's usually the question. Well, it's because we live in Romans 8, 18 to 25. We live in a sin-cursed creation. Things happen. Notice in verse 28, and we know, again, know something, knowledge, information, thinking, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. What is it to be called? Well, come over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Called according to his purpose. The the Calvinists love this section because it uses big words that they then go throw $5 and $10 definitions behind. But when you come to the book, again, it's the simplicity that's in Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief on the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel. How are you called? Hey, Rick, come on up here, buddy. How are you called? By the gospel. He chose you to salvation because you're in His Son and because you're in the body of Christ. The salvation here in the context is back up there from verse 
2 and following down to verse 12 about the, the issues of the Antichrist and the 70th week of Daniel and the wrath of God to come. You don't go through that as a member of the body of Christ. You're taken home. There's your salvation. Verse 13. Verse 14, he called you by our gospel. There's your justification. There's where he calls you. And he calls you according to his purpose. Come over to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 11. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 11. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Jesus Christ our Lord. You better have written down by that verse, chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Here we go, verse 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, Ephesians 1, 9, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. He had a plan. He has a plan. He's got a purpose. And you participate in it, the moment of your salvation, and you're placed into the, the church, the body of Christ. And he says, I'm, my purpose is to take that body and to sprinkle it through the heavens and to bring the heavenly government back underneath the rule and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, the headship of Christ. And you know what? We know that all things work for the good to them that love him, for them that are called according to his purpose. Go back there to Romans 8. Notice that verse. Romans 8, verse 28. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. He's not... Folk, don't we know the end of the story? We looked at it last week. Don't we know where our home is? Don't we understand how to get there? Yeah. Are you sure about it? Yeah. The Holy Spirit said we're going to... God Almighty said we're going to do this. His Word says I'm going to do... I'm going to call you by my gospel, the gospel given to the Apostle Paul, and faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then because of that, I'm going to give you an identity in Christ, a position in Jesus Christ. Your, your old man's going to be crucified. You're going to have this new man. You're going to renew that new man day by day. And I'm, we're going to do it by the issues of the dispensation of grace and, and grace teaching, the grace life. And then because of that, then the Spirit's going to come along and energize that, and it's going to begin to work for you. So no matter what comes your way, it's all good even in the infirmities because it's a thinking process it's a mindset to work down through that and he's called us for according to his purpose he's going to put us up into those heavenly places look at verse 29 for whom he did foreknow uh oh who did he foreknow we're talking about the church, the body of Christ, aren't we? He, knew, he, knew, he had us all figured out before the foundation of the world. What did he do to, to, to the church? He also did predestinate to become conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among brethren. Predestination, predestinate. The word defines itself. I, I, I used to talk to a guy. He was a... Calvinist, five-pointer, four-and-a-half. One day he was just a one-er. Then he got the five. You know, all, and I, he used to talk all the time about predestination and all this stuff. And he had volumes of stuff. And I looked at him and I said, what does that word mean? Destination what? Predetermined. Where's the home for you and I? Heaven. That's already been what? Predetermined. Do you know that if you're a lost person, your destiny has not been determined yet? Because you can get saved still. But once you become a member of the church, guess what? Your destiny is done. It's been determined for you. He says, I'm going to take that body, the, the folks that are going to make up that body of Christ, and I've determined for them to be in that heavenly places, that he might be the firstborn among many. Can, uh, by the way, there in verse 29, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Do you remember Philippians 3 in verse 21? Philippians 3. You guys with me? 
I know it's warm outside, but it's not. Philippians 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, conformed to the image of the Son. Why? How? Whereby, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. There's according to his purpose. He's got a plan for you. Are you sure about this? Yeah, why? Because we're in the plan. We're in the program. We're right there. And how we know that is because God's word teaches us that. So, by the way, when he says firstborn among many, brethren, you're in Philippians. Just go one page. Well, firstborn. Come, look over at Colossians 1. You know what it is to be firstborn? To be firstborn. Whoa, that was deep, wasn't it? All right, the offering box is in the back. Let's pay double today, okay? That was deep. No, firstborn. That's the first one, isn't it? Look at Colossians 1, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. You know that you're not quite there on that one. He's the first one that was what? Raised from the dead <laughs> and stayed raised. Okay? Jonah was resurrected. He died, though. Lazarus was resurrected, but he died again. But the Lord was resurrected never to die. He's the firstborn. You and I are the firstborn to have. You know what? This issue about resurrection and the resurrection life, do you know that we get that before Israel does? So we're the firstborn, the first fruits. So when you come back to Romans 8, verse number 28 and 29 here, we're, again, theologians like to trip themselves up. They break their spiritual necks on this stuff. And you're just, we're just reading it. What's going on here? You know how you can be sure of all this? Look at the Holy Spirit. Look at the plan of God. Look at what God has planned to do with you. Verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. All of that verse... It's talking about people who are members of the body of Christ. He's talking about all of this is going to be done according to his purpose. All of it. By the way, you'll notice that all of it is past tense. He did predestinate, then he called. How are we called? According to the gospel, Paul's gospel. And whom he called them, he also justified. When you heard the gospel of your salvation, what happened to you? You were sealed with the Spirit. You're blessed with all spiritual blessings. You pass from, life, from death to life. You're, you, the, God, the justice of God is satisfied that you have perfect righteousness in who you are in Christ. It is all done. But notice how that verse ends. And whom he justified them, he also what? Glorified. Do you know the mindset of God Almighty is as, is as if you are already seated in heavenly places with him? You're already there. Now, in our reality, well, we're not. We're down here in the nasty now and now. We're in the infirmity. But do you realize that if you take your mindset and shift it to God's mindset, that you know what your perception will be then on the infirmities? That they're going to do what? Work for us a more far weight, of, an exceeding weight of glory. You can look at that infirmity because how are you? How does God view you? He views you as justified. He views you as glorified. He looks at you as an adult in his family. And when you begin to look at yourself that way and say, wait a minute, I'm a member of the family. I'm a member of the body. And he says that I, have, I am glorified. Now, obviously, we're still here, okay? But our situation, our, our reality is that we're what? There. That's why he would say there in Ephesians 2 and verse number 6. 
Ephesians 2 and verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're already there. So when you have a loose grip on the now and a firm grip on eternity, guess what happens to your thinking process? You go, wow. Time is short. Let's get on with the program. Let's get going. Come back to Romans 8. So, are you sure about this so far? Yeah. yeah. Why? I got the Spirit working with me. I got His Word working in me. I got His, I got his Word on His Word that He's going to do some things with me. And then you got verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? Boy, what a question. What are you going to say to this stuff? Are you convinced? Are you persuaded? Are you sure about this? This is the word of God on the matter. By the way, you notice we just read it. Okay? Because sometimes just simply reading it, the light bulbs should go off. Now, finish that verse. If God be for us, who can be against us? We got all of this doctrine in us. We got all of the stuff in Romans 1 to 5 and in chapter 6, 7, and 8. There's more coming in 9 to 16. All of this information. Man, we get it into our inner man. We build it up in it. We, we're studying our position in Christ and we learn how to play that position and we learn the right rules to be playing by. We got all this going on and then we turn around and we let some little nitwit thing over here defeat us. And it's like, wait a minute. If God is for you, who can be against you? You're a part, he's for you. You're a part of his program. You're a part of his plan. You're a part of what he's doing today in the age of grace, in 2019. So why in the world would you, oh, no, they don't like me on Facebook. Oh, they unfriended me. They're not, fo they're not, I don't have enough Twitter. I don't have enough Facebook. I don't have, wait, 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 and, and you begin to get your acceptance over here in things that are fleeting rather than understanding that you are accepted in the beloved. Look at verse 32. He that spared not his own son, Notice how much God is for you in verse 32. Notice how much he's on your side. Notice how much he's what you, he's in your corner. What did he do? He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us? Notice Paul talking here, making reference to the grace of God. Who can be against you, man? Look at who's for you. Why are you worried about if they're against? Well, look at who's on your side. He spared not his own son. And he did that in order to not only save you from eternal damnation and eternal separation from him, but he did it also so that he could freely give us all things. What should be coming to mind? Ephesians 1, 3, Colossians 2, 10, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, where he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's made us complete in him. He's given us all grace and all sufficiency and all things. All of that should just be booming in your mind. And you go down Ephesians 1, you start in verse 3, you go all the way to the end of the chapter, and he says, are you, I, I almost feel like Homer. On the Simpsons. Do Look at what I got. And I'm worried about something else. Look at who you are. Who can be against you? He's for you. 
He's with you. He's on your side. He's freely given us all things. Boy, that's grace. That's the free gift of grace. Your life ought to be operating on the basis of that right there. The way you live life ought to be right out of those, these verses right here. Man, he's on my side. I got his word on the matter. I got the third member of the Godhead working with me. I got, a, I got he gave me everything. Verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Do you know that the only person that can lay, there, there's a guy, there's a character in the Bible who goes around accusing the brethren day and night called the adversary. Do you know that he does not do that with you? He does that with the nation of Israel. You know he doesn't do that with you? Because you are already sealed. Israel's still got some things to work out and figure out and get through. You have already been given and blessed with all spiritual blessings. You take those spiritual blessings that you and I get. Do this. This is a little cul-de-sac move, okay? You take those blessings that you and I have received in Ephesians chapter 1, and you go over to Romans chapter number 9, the next chapter over. Look, you're right there, right? Look at Romans 9. Look down at verse 4. Just look here. Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the what? Wait a minute, didn't we already look at adoption a couple weeks ago? We already got that. We have the spirit of adoption and the glory. Boy, haven't we already been glorified? Mm. And the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promise whose are the fathers and of whom... See, you take those gifts, those blessings that you and I get, and you go run them up and compare to, to, the, to Israel, and you know that they don't have that yet? That's all future stuff for them in the kingdom? You're front-loaded. They're back-loaded. You get it up front. Your deal's done. Theirs has still got to work itself out. That's why he doesn't mess with you as far as accusing you. Now, he comes and messes with you. Throws little fiery darts at you. But he can't accuse you. You know why, verse 833, who can charge? Who, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. You know why he can't do that to you? Because the justice of God has been satisfied. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be what? Made His righteousness, the righteousness. The justice of God looks at you, looks at Calvary, and because you're in His Son, and because you're, doing, you're in His program, and you're on board with, with, with uh, Calvary, you're in His Son, that identity, and He says, justice of God is good. When God looks over there in Isaiah and he says, hey, they're my people and I'm going to do this. Oh, you know what old Satan does? He goes, hang on a minute. <laughs> they are capt they're lawfully captive. They belong to me. And God says, no, when that's right, they do. But right now, in the future, though, when I come back, guess what's going to happen? They're going to become mine. Who can lay, who, who's going to charge you? Nobody can, because God justified you. Next verse. Who is he that condemneth? Well, if God settled it, and the justice of God is satisfied, and the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is mine, then nobody can do that, can they? There's nothing there. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You see, folks, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, not only is it a code identity that we have in Romans 6, but it is also him looking at us going, 
They're mine. I paid the deal. It's paid in full. Romans 4 and verse number 25 is clear. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The resurrection says paid in full. It's all taken care of. You with me? Are you sure about this? Yes, sir. Yeah. Now watch verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, no one can. But I'll tell you what, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12, there's a battle raging who sure enough tries. And the adversary does raise up and come along, and he can't accuse you, but he sure enough can mess with you. And the battle begins to rage. And what Paul's going to do now in verse 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, is he's going to look at how much God values and esteems you. Notice the verse, 35. Who, sh who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, no one can. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Boy, look at the list. Tribulation, the pressures of life come in and get on you. Distresses, no way to escape the pressure. You ever get some time where the pressures are just like, man, I just, I'm done, I'm out, I'm over, uncle? persecutions the adversary coming along and being up against you really about who you are in Christ famine that's economic pressure nakedness the lack of physical luxuries or really necessities peril that's dangers of everyday life you know your life is in peril every day you don't see it I think about the folks who grew up in the Middle East where every day there was a bombing or something going on. See, we didn't have that. We were protected from We have it here now. Just this morning, early, there was a report about a police incident down on baseline. Drive-by shooting. Uh, did you see the one back east, the guy drive-by shooting? Shoot, he was shooting from the car and shot his car mate, <laughs> the guy with him. He's shooting. He shot him, too. <laughs> I think a double whammy, yeah, and killed him, you know. Perils of life, everyday life. Paul over there in 2 Corinthians life says peril in the sea, peril, peril, peril. There's danger. And then he says, the or, or sword. Who, ha, who, who, who wields the sword? It's the government. So you have the opposition of government. Folks. Life's happy, 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 huh? It is with the proper attitude, the proper thinking. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Boy, what are, how are we to think about this? Verse 18 again. We live in the present suffering, don't we? We're, we're going to suffer, but it's not because God doesn't love us. It's because we're under that purpose and plan of God. We're under verse 18 again. Then he says, verse, seven, verse 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I love that. Nay. Hey, you got all this going on? You need to remember something, Bubba. In all these things you are more than conquerors through him that loved us. In all the sufferings, in all these, pro in all the problems here, in, in all the distresses, you are more than conquerors. In the tribulation, you're to be patient. In the distress, you're to you're to take an, have an advantage there. In the persecutions, you've got some spiritual weapons that you can call on that armor. In the fam in famine, you know what? You're, you have such wealth and riches in who you are in Christ. In that peril, yeah, in the sword, you have confidence in, in God. He's he going to fix it one day. But he says more than conquers. You know what it is to conquer something? 
That's to win the battle, isn't it? To win. The victor goes to spoils. But do you know what it is to be a more than conqueror? A more than a conqueror? It's to win the battle. But it's to take the spoil, the, those that we've conquered. It's to take the tribulation, the distress, the persecution, the famine, the nakedness, the peril, and the sword. And it's to turn it and have it become our benefit. It's to take the light affliction, but, which is only for a moment, but it works for us a far more exceeding weight of glory, eternal and weight of glory. It's to take the moment and to turn it to our advantage. Did we defeat the moment? Yes, but we use the moment to our advantage. We are a more than a conqueror. And where do we do it? Through him that loved us. You can never do this on your own. At every one of these moments and every one of this list, you try to do this on your own, you're defeated. You lose. But when you rest in who you are in Christ and you look at it and you say, you know what, I can have the victory here because of him and because of who I am in him, then no one can charge you. No one can come up. And no one can separate you. Because you have, you're have you a more than conqueror. You've taken the situation and you've spun it. Now watch verse 38. For I am persuaded. Are you persuaded? <laughs> I hope so. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Persuaded. Look over in chapter 4 of Romans. In verse 21, talking about Abraham. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to... Are you fully persuaded that he's going to come along and do what he tells you he's going to do? Chapter 14 of Romans, in verse number 5. One man esteem one day above another, and another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You have to come to your own convictions about some of this. You go back there to Romans 8, the list that he lists here. Death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, death, nor any All of that list is all spiritual. It's all mechanisms of where our warf- warfare is Look over at Ephesians 6, just real quick here. I'm sorry. Ephesians 6, verse 12. You see, folks, when he talks about death and life, who has the keys? Who had the keys to death and hell? The adversary did. At Calvary, you know what he won? The keys, the authority. So we're talking about spiritual things here. Ephesians 6, verse 12, you need to remember this greatly. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. All of that, that list back in Romans 8, 38 and 39, has to do with the spiritual conflict that we're in. How do we handle the physical conflict? Verse 35, 36. Hey, we just remember who we are in him. We use that. We use that understanding to our advantage and our benefit but how do we who nobody's going to be able to separate us the adversary can't separate you and that spiritual onslaught that comes against you the spiritual wickedness you have a mechanism in Ephesians 6 the rest of this chapter about the armor of God the doctrine to come up one more verse, 1 Corinthians 15. Well, I'm getting no, I'm just kidding. 1 Corinthians 15. 
Folks, are you sure about this? Are you persuaded about it? You see, when we talk about Romans 8, there's a lot in this passage. When we go through the passage verse by verse, we'll dig into it, okay? But what I want you to see is is that when you decide, you know what, I'm going to live life this way, you're good to go. Because you got the Word of God on it. And we walk by faith and not by sight. And you know what God says, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. 15, 57. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The victory is ours because of who we are in Christ. we got to go live life that way. Learn it, get the details, and then go live life. That's who we are in his son. Okay? Whew, didn't think we'd get through that whole chapter, did you? A lot going on in there. I just want you to get the flavor and the feel. Okay? All right. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word, for the instructions, for the... The doctrine that was laid out for us here, that as we go in our day-to-day lives, that we would carry the victory and carry out the glory plan and live life as who we are in your Son. Get in the book, learn what that is.